Hi, and welcome to the Chapter 8 handout, where we discuss the valuation models from Chapter 8. The first valuation model is the constant growth model. And the constant growth dividend model, as it's sometimes referred to, looks at the dividends a company pays. And dividends are always denoted by D. It could be D0, D1, D2. So D0 would be dividends being paid today. D1 would be dividends being paid next year. And D2 would be dividends being paid in two years. So in this first example, our formula is D1 divided by K minus G. So K is the acquired rate of return. And G is the growth rate in the dividend. So to calculate what the stock price, P is the stock price, P for price. So to calculate what the stock price should be. And the idea is that if, the, if a stock pays a dividend, that gives you a certain value towards your stock price. So this formula is supposed to give us an idea of what the value of the stock should be based on the dividends it pays. So the formula is rather simple to calculate. I just take the dividends and I'm going to divide that by the required rate of return minus the growth of the dividend and that gives me a stock price of 80 percent. So the required rate of return is calculated through say the capital asset pricing model and that's something that's a separate calculation. Most of these, all these problems would give you the required rate of return. G is a growth rate that the company designates that the dividend will grow at. So if we know that the dividend's growing, uh, if our required rate is 15%, the dividend's growing at 10%, we can use those two factors to help calculate what the value of the stock should be. And if the stock is trading below $80, we would purchase it. And if the stock's trading above $80, we would sell it. And that's kind of the idea against these valuation formulas is to know what price to buy or sell the stock at. Okay, so now what if in some of these homework problems, they may just give you D0 and not give you D1. So if they give you D0 and we have G, we know how to calculate D1. Just like uh, think of G is the growth of your uh, income or the growth uh, or percentage raise you might get at work. So if you made two dollars and twenty-five cents an hour, and your boss decides to give you an eight percent raise, how much are you making per hour next year? It's the same concept. So I would just take um, one plus the growth rate, and I'd multiply that by the dividend. And this gives me next year's earnings. So, so if you made $2.25 an hour and you had an 8% pay increase, you're now making $2.43 an hour. It's the same concept. So, so sometimes they may only give you D0, and you could calculate D1 by applying the growth rate to increase D0 to next year's dividend. So, and then the D2, I would take, of course, the 2.43, 2 and I, I multiply that by 1 plus G or 1.08% to get D2. And that's some of the homework questions may ask for a D2 scenario. Uh, and then I just defer back to the, the constant growth model to calculate the valuation of the stock. And again, I would take the, div, the new dividend that we just calculated, which is D1, and I'm going to divide it by K minus G. And that gives us the value of the stock price. And this is just an idea of what the stock should be trading at. So if, uh, oh, and by the way, any of these handouts you, you pull down from the Blackboard, I also have the answer key of, of the handout uh, in a, sep a separate tab. So if you uh, are working on this bef uh, before I have the, this video up, or if you want to go back and actually see the formulas in the cells, you could go back to this handout, pull it down, and, and see all the answer keys. And I do that for all the handouts. Okay, moving on to zero growth model. What if there's no growth in the dividend? The dividend is a fixed dividend. This, the formula is even simpler. We just take the dividend divided by K. So there are some stocks that will just say, this is a fixed dividend, and it's not going to change. In that case, it makes the valuation model very simple to figure out what I should pay for the stock. What is the stock worth based on the, the dividend that it pays. So, you know, now if you look at 
the higher the dividend, so let's just play with this for a minute to get a concept of how this formula works. If the dividend increases, we'd expect the stock price to increase because the company is more value. And you can see here, as I increase the dividend, the stock price increases. Okay. Now, what about the return, required rate of return? If your required rate of return increases, what do you think will happen with the stock price? Go ahead, make a guess. Stock price goes down. So if the required rate of return goes up, the stock price goes down. And that's because you're looking at the difference between the growth rate and the required rate of return. Now the growth rate here is zero, so it doesn't, the growth, um, the, there's no growth rate. But the required rate of return, the higher the required rate of return, the less valuable uh, the stock becomes because it's getting closer to what it's paying in the dividend. And you can see that in the formula, even up here in the formula, if the larger K gets, the smaller the value of the stock is going to be. So you see how that went down? So 15 to 20% the stock gets cut in half. Uh, that's because you don't want a big gap between your required rate of return and your growth of dividend. So if, say your required rate of return matches the dividend, well actually you can't calculate that, you're going to have a very high stock price. Okay. The, because you're getting all of the growth, the growth is covering all of your required return, and so you're going to get, as the years go by, the, the dividends keeps getting larger and larger and larger, eclipsing your required rate of return. Stock's very valuable at that point. That's why required rate of return is always higher than the growth rate because the stock the stock price will reflect that. Okay, so moving forward in the PE ratio model, here we're going to look at stock price uh, is going to be calculated by the estimated earnings per share and the expected PE multiple. So we have uh, the company can give us the growth in earnings and we can have last year's earnings per share and we use we can use that to calculate next year's estimated earnings. So if the stock price is uh, the earnings per share is two dollars and twenty-five cents, and we we can multiply that by one plus the growth rate in earnings per share. Whoop, didn't like that. Uh, let's see. One plus growth rate, and we're going to multiply that by last year's earnings per share, and we get next year's estimated earnings per share. So if the earnings per share are two dollars and twenty-five cents, and it's going to and the earnings per share are going to grow at twenty percent. That will give us $2.70 as next year's estimated earnings per share. So that's how you get the estimated earnings per share. Now the expected PE is given to us here, so it's something that um, you just really forecast it. It's sort of a guess. There's no real way to calculate it. But if we, um, there's no meaning, there's no formula we use to give a magic expected PE. It's sort of an analysis of the stock situation, the stock market, many factors are involved. But if we expect next year's PE to be five, and the estimated earnings to be 2.70, we could use this information by simply multiplying the expected earnings per share times the expected PE ratio, and we get next year's stock price. Because stock price is going to trade at five times the earnings. So it's five times the earnings gives us our stock price. Now, if the expected PE is going to go up, if we expect the price to earnings ratio for the stock to be six, we are going to see you know, a higher stock price. Because now it's trading at six times earnings or 10 times earnings. So the if the PE ratio is increasing for a stock, that's a good thing. It's going to push the stock price up. And of course, earnings per share, if they're increasing, that will also push the stock price up. So this is a more commonly used, more effective model than the dividends model because most stocks don't, a lot of stocks don't pay dividends. So this is a model that was developed to reflect the fact that many stocks do not pay dividends and that we could, we could work with earnings per share uh, and it makes sense. If earnings per share are increasing, I'd expect the stock price to increase. So we simply look at the, the earnings per share that the company projects the earnings to increase at. Uh, we can use that compared to last year's earnings to get next year's earnings and multiply it by the P-E ratio. Now the expected P-E ratio, for many stocks, P-E ratios stay the same or maybe are increasing a little bit as earnings are increasing. So to be conservative, you can keep expected P-E ratio close to last year's P.E. ratio, but the overall market characteristics of the markets in the bull or bear phase come into play as well. But this is a very uh, useful valuation model that's still used 
these dividend models are not really commonly used today they're outdated but this this PE ratio model is a current model that is still in use today now when we talked about K earlier how do you calculate K which is also considered the required rate of return so which is this triple R here so triple R is required rate of return uh, RFR is risk-free rate beta is beta market return is the the mar the return of the market and risk-free rate is the risk-free rate considered usually um, a 10-year Treasury bill so we could use this information to give us an idea of the actual re required turn you you required return you would need based on the risks of the stock and the risks of the stock are really measured by beta so beta is a measure of the risk of the stock so the risk-free rate we would say is maybe the 10-year treasury rate. It's something, we call it risk-free because if you invest in a 10-year treasury, there's no risk of losing your money. Um, the government, the U.S. government is always going to pay that. You're, there's no risk of losing your money. And it, inside that treasury, we have uh, in, the inflation is built into that and the, and the return, the real rate of return. So that's our starting point. So that's why we want to back it out of the market return. So we take the market return of 15%. So that's the average return for the market. We take away the risk-free rate because that's built into the average return of the market. We don't want to magnify that. We only want to magnify the, the market risk premium. So we take out the risk-free rate from the market return and we're left with basically a market risk premium. So if your company has a beta greater than one, that means it's riskier. So that's going to play into your required rate of return. So riskier companies are going to need higher returns. And you can see that as I, if I manipulate beta to two, you'll see that the required rate of return increases. Beta of three, entire rate, required rate of return increases. And as I lower beta, the required rate of return decreases. The riskier the stock is, the more return that you're gonna be re required. So these are the factors that we're gonna look at. The risk-free rate and the market return, say, uh, for the past year. And we're gonna multiply that by beta as the amplifier of risk. And that will denote what our required rate of return is for each stock. So riskier stocks are going to require higher rates of returns. Less riskier stocks are going to require less higher rates of return. And then calculating this is just an, um, an exercise in your PIMDAS, in your order of operations. And you see here that um, I have the brackets around the um, stocks similar to what I have in the formula. So when you create the uh, Excel formula, make sure that you have the, you have the you compartmentalize the uh, parentheses so that you're calculating market return minus the risk free rate first before you calculate before you multiply it by beta this x stands for times by the way and then before you add it to the risk free rate we always add back the risk free rate because we, we subtracted it out because we didn't want to magnify it but we add it back because it is a factor of our required rate of return uh, and this is an important fo uh, fo a very important calculation in finance that are used for uh, these required rates of return uh, I could say, uh, or uh, K, we call it or K, is what we would use to calculate uh, many of our other re uh, valuation models. Okay, so that's it for Chapter 8, Valuation Models Explained. Uh, thank you, and I'll see you again next time.